Welcome, Welcome. to DNA Live from the Kiosk. We have an audience. <laughs> we have an audience. <laughs> a little bit bigger group than usual, I yes, guess. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so last week, uh, we we have to apologize. Uh, we know that the Wi-Fi cut out about 20 minutes in, so we're going to ask Father Tim as he opens the show to pray to Saint Isidore, so we don't run into that <laughs> issue this time. So, <laughs> so as if something happens, it's his fault. Right, right. <laughs> there we go. That works. All right. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, my friends, wherever you find okay. yourself in the world today, as we come to you uh, through the internet, we mark ourselves in the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Oh God, our Heavenly Father, we ask you to be with us this day, especially we take the time aside for the business of our schedule to come together in prayer and conversation about our faith and those things that are important to us, especially today as we speak about the Rosary Bowl that uh, we are preparing for on the Feast of the Queenship of Mary this coming August 22nd. We pray through the intercession of St. Isidore and through St. Charbel, whom we honor in the church's calendar this day. May God bless you in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, show. Father Tim. Sounds Thank great. You. Being a bit. Okay, so here we go. So we have a number of things to cover before we ask uh, His Grace to come on. So yes. I think, uh, yeah, where are we going to start today? Oh my, there's so much. Uh, more and more people, I just feel like love is in the air. Like, it's just like, it's incredible. I mean, these, <laughs> these people are just like, I mean, charity. We have all these people that are donating their time, their talents, That's prayers. Yes. Um, it's incredible things that are coming in. The latest being from Father from Toronto. You want to share that one about oh, all the rosaries? That's right. So uh, I think we announced last week that uh, the Congregation of Holy Cross, so that's the actual congregation that uh, Venerable Father Peyton uh, is, order, is from. And of course, he's the one that did the rosary bowls and all these things back in the 40s and 50s. So we just had an email from Father Wilson. They are bringing 500 rosaries to give out and 200 rosaries for our rosary making on the Thursday, which is amazing. And it's not just for children. Everybody can right, come and make rosaries. Right. And we're going to have right. lots. Oh, that's so, so, yeah, as we're getting forward to the August 22nd time, and actually it's on that day. So we have rosary making on the morning of August 22nd, and now obviously lots of beads in tow, and everybody is welcome. So if you're making your way here, uh, that's really an event that we hope that you're going to see. While you're here, actually, we'll also have the Catechesis of Good Shepherd. We have an amazing atrium here, just ooh, not so far, maybe a nine iron away from where I'm, <laughs> where I'm sitting. And uh, of course, we're going to have Ruth Ann McClure, who's going to do some incredible tours. I, I'm amazed. Every time I go into that atrium, I realize how much I don't know. Oh. You know, and how it's remarkable what you can learn. Yeah, she deserves a hand of applause. Yes, amen. <laughs> yeah, that's going to be great. Thank you, Ruth Ann. <laughs> now, we also talked about prayer, and we've got the a lady that does this ministry called One Hill Mary at a Time right. yes. from Chicago area. And she's a mother of, I think she has eight children now. And I think with right, her last right. one was, I think, like an infant, a newborn. Yes. And she contacted us and said, is there any way that I can help? Right. And that was incredible. We had a great conversation with her. She has over 30,000 followers. So she's going to get out there and help have them pray at the same time. They're going to try and pray at the same time that we're praying from two to three at Lansdowne here in yeah, um, that's TD Place. So that's incredible. Yeah. That's another great thing. Yeah. One more thing too. We yes. even we even had a um, a wonderful person donate the cost for another person to go on pilgrimage. Wants to remain anonymous, and I just right. think like all of this charity, all of this love is happening, yes. and we've shared with you on other shows about other people donating things as well, including our banner. So right, right, right. Even from the House of Canvas. So again, thank you everybody for all that you're doing to help us out here, to help I'm make our Mother Mary known and loved. What else? There was one more thing. Oh I yes, wanted. let me see now. Now I will have to look at a list. Oh, Monsignor Beach. Yes. Yeah, spoke with oh, him. yes. So I had a great conversation with Monsignor Beach at, at uh, St. Patrick's Basilica, yes. uh, and they're promoting it everywhere, you know, on the website, flyers, everything. So that's awesome. Yes. So actually, I did Google Rosary Bowl Ottawa today, and I was amazed how many people are putting it in their bulletins. And really, it's making international news. We've had LifeSite, BC Catholic, yes. Catholic Register, Spirit Daily, 
and and others, you know, some in French that I can't pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> but so, that's great. That's yes. great. So yeah, I know what I was going to say. Please come. Please come. And last week we found out that Salt and Light is coming. Oh yeah, that's excellent. That's excellent. Yeah. So excellent, excellent, excellent. They're they're going to be capturing some footage of the incredible special mass that's going to be taking place on August 22nd. And we hope to have the foundress of the Queenship of Mary with us next week to talk a little bit more about that. So we'll leave that till next week. Oh, yeah. And they're also going to capture some footage of the Rosary Bowl as well. So I guess one more thing to end off before we ask. Oh, yes. And we also have up. a limited amount, but beautiful T-shirts here. We're mm. going to show you on the screen here. Right. There is one there. We have some for children. We have some for adults here with Our Lady the Cape on there. Mm -hmm. uh, some have the martyrs on there, St. Joseph. And these were donated by dear friends that have That's become right. dear friends these last three years. They started with us the very first year, three years ago, up at the Cape. Their names are Joachim and Anne. Yes. Like what names, eh? Joachim and Anne. Isn't there a feast day soon? <laughs> I I think it's like tomorrow or something, isn't it? <laughs> no? 26th. The 26th. Oh, it's 26. Yeah, they're amazing. They're patron saints. So they're from Toronto. They've yeah. been amazing. And each year they've supplied hospitality. They brought a cake. The very right. first year they just came in with a cake because I was like, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And all of a sudden this family shows up with a cake. I mean, it's just incredible. So yes. this year they're going to supply sure. a cake for us again, celebrating the 325th anniversary of the conference sharing the Most Holy Rosary. So thank you, Anne and Joachim, too. I mean, that's fantastic. Amen. And then one other thing. Oh, yes. If you can't do a T-shirt or we don't have them available, we also have lapel pins, which my honey is nicely That's interested right. in here with our Lady the Cape on there, our Queen of Canada. And one other big thing, we have to share this, okay, because yesterday was my oh, honey's, yes. oh, All yeah. Right. All right, go ahead. My honey's yeah. baptismal birthday was yesterday. And uh, what an incredible day that you had because you were meeting with a travel agency. And what happened? Yeah, that was almost surreal because I don't think I realized till you asked me the question later. But here we are on my baptismal feast day, uh, meeting with this travel agency. And they basically asked us, would we like to host a pilgrimage to Fatima and Lourdes next October? This is like, what? So, oh, that's interesting. And then as we were um, heading home, I think you said, what was the church that you were baptized in? Well, Our Lady of Fatima here huh? in Ottawa. I so isn't it something? Yeah. So that's incredible. Yeah. That's 58 incredible. Fifty-eight years ago. Fifty-eight years Bridget ago. St. Bridget of Sweden, pray for us. Yeah, amen, amen, yeah, amen. So that that's awesome. Uh, and a number of people are ordering this the double CD set so that they can hear the story of Our Lady of the Cape before mm. you go up with us because it's an incredible story. So uh, we just remind you about that as well. Yes. So Whoa. go to rosarybowl.com, register if you haven't registered, yes. and also enroll in the Rosary Confraternity if you haven't done yes. that as well. Yes. We have people from all over the world uh, enrolling, so yes. it's awesome. And coming to the Rosary Bowl, different cities, United States. That's like true. It's, We're going to be great to be able to announce on that first night, welcome from so you know, welcome from here, welcome from there, and it's just going to be incredible. Amen. So on that note. Here we go. So we are really pleased to have His Grace Archbishop Terence Prendergrass join us today on DNA Live. Come so. on up. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> it's such a pleasure to have you, uh, Your Grace, here with us. And thought we'd do something a little bit different because we, of course, see you uh, celebrating all these things around the diocese. And I I don't know how to keep up with you, quite frankly. I see all these <laughs> tweets everywhere and I go, "This he's everywhere, you know? So, uh, but I thought if, if you wouldn't mind sharing, you know, a little bit about the backstory, maybe your vocation story, if, if you would do that a little bit. Well, thanks very much. Uh, it's good to be here with all of you. And uh, I guess, Telling one's vocation story helps maybe others identify with uh, the discernment, the search for what God wants us to do in our lives. I grew up in North End, Montreal, a place called the Hunsik. Uh, I used to serve Mass at uh, 7 a.m. in the rectory of our parish, St. Rita's. There was no church at that time. Uh, we built the church in 1956, but this is uh, earlier than that. And... Um, I've been serving maybe two or three years when uh, one of the priests said to me, uh, Terry, have you ever thought about being a priest? And I said, no. <laughs> but from then on, I began to think about it. Uh, so planting a seed is often very important. 
And so that was the first seed and uh, began to think about it. And our new parish, uh, new assistant priest, Father David Fitzpatrick, a lifelong friend. We became lifelong friends until he passed away a couple years ago. Uh, he was a very good in supporting me and encouraging me. He had a little club called the uh, Pius X Club. It was to encourage young men to think of the priesthood. I think I'm the only one who went all the way through, but anyway, uh, <laughs> there were others who accompanied me on the occasion. And uh, after elementary school in Montreal, uh, in my, my own neighborhood, I went to the Jesuit school in uh, Notre Dame de Grasse, the west end of Montreal, which was a long way off because we didn't have a subway in Montreal in those days. Uh, so um, during my time there, I fell under the influence of the Jesuit fathers. Uh, there were some young men who were scholastics teaching me and uh, guiding me on the stage and on the playing field as the coaches. And I really admired them and I wanted to be like them. And uh, so uh, to the end of, my, end of my high school, I uh, went to uh, see Father Fitz to say, um, I have something to say to you and I don't know how to do it. He said, you're going to be a Jesuit. I said, yes, said, that's good. <laughs> he said, I could, I could see it coming. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think that's important because sometimes you figure, you know, people are pulling you your way or that way. Uh, I went through this with one of my young seminarians, uh, friends uh, in Ottawa, who uh, I had my eye on for the seminary. And he came and told me that he was discerning this group and that group and so forth. He said, but finally, I've decided to become a Jesuit. I said, oh, my. <laughs> I said, I think I've been through this. I've seen this movie before. Right. Uh, so um, uh, it's, it was unusual. It's unusual today to enter a religious order after high school, but I did that in those days. I was 17. I left home on the uh, 13th of uh, August, 1961, uh, overnight train to Toronto and then on to Guelph, which is where the Jesuit bishop was there. And um, we entered on the 14th, so my anniversary for uh, Jesuit life is the 14th of, uh, of August, the day before uh, the Assumption of Mary. Uh, two years after the novitiate, we took our, our vows. And in the Jesuits, it's a little bit unusual, we take uh, perpetual vows after mm -hmm. the novitiate. Uh, they're perpetual on your part, but conditional on the part of the order. So the order can send you away, say, we don't think that you have the qualities and graces that are needed to live on. So anyway. I, I did two, four years in Guelph, uh, doing my two years of the mission, two years of junior eight. Then I went to study in New York City, uh, Fordham University, to do my philosophy. So that took me to 1967, and then 1967, which is Expo year in Montreal, I sent back to my my alma mater, Loyola High, to teach Latin and Greek. Wow! And I was the last Latin and Greek teacher, so nice. I killed the languages. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, when I was in high school, they asked me, what are you studying Greek for? I said, well, because when I go to the Greek restaurant, I can read the menu. You know? <laughs> but it became my life's work. You know, I was a teacher of uh, Greek uh, and uh, New Testament for many years. Anyway, after my uh, two years teaching Montreal, where I was a coach and ran a bookstore and things like that. What kind of coach? Sorry. I coached hockey and uh, football. Oh, Okay. I never really was a very good player, but <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to be a, a star to coach, and so we did very well. We lost to one heartbreaking uh, championship uh, in my second year teach, coaching hockey. Mm. Uh, we lost in uh, overtime when the goalie, who was stellar throughout the game, let a soft puck go in the... Oh. And those are, those are heartbreaking things. Yeah. So with the young people, you get to appreciate the highs and lows, and you accompany them, and you become friends with them. Uh, so anyway, after that, I went to, teach, uh, to study theology in Toronto. I was ordained on the uh, 10th of June, 1972. So I'm 47 years a priest this year. And uh, then I continued my studies. I continued to study scripture for uh, two more, three more years to do a doctorate in New Testament. And then I was immediately engaged to teach uh, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, mm. at the a school called the Atlantic School of Theology, where I was also responsible for uh, seminary formation for the candidates for the Atlantic Diocese that were sending their students there to, Atlanta, to Halifax. So I was there for six years, and I guess the provincial said, well, if he's doing this formation work for the diocese, maybe he can do it for us. So I became the rector of the Jesuit Seminary in Toronto, Regis College, which was my, again, one of my schools where I was a, uh, a student. I was there for, I've been six years as a student and I was six years as a rector. A little bit strange for me to uh, go back as a young uh, rector, 37 years of age, uh, 
to be the superior of the people who had been my teachers. Right. So that was kind of uh, humbling and uh, frightening, but uh, I survived. And at the end of uh, those six years, uh, since I'd been teaching for a dozen years, I uh, was given a sabbatical at the Biblical Institute in Rome. I had a wonderful year there. And the provincial asked me if I would go to Regina the next year. So I taught at Campion College as a visiting professor of New Testament and Old Testament and Christian theology. Uh, I learned to curl when I was at Regina. Uh, but I haven't done it since. <laughs> <laughs> I stick with hockey and <laughs> skating and so on. So uh, after a year there, I went back to Regis College and then became Dean of Theology and uh, was involved in my latter two years there as Dean uh, doing a seminary visitation for the English-speaking seminaries in Canada. And then I had another sabbatical year in, uh, in Jerusalem at the École Biblique et Archéologique Française, the French Biblical and Archaeological Institute, but run by the Dominican Fathers. So uh, I was a visiting professor for, by the Catholic Biblical Association that year. And uh, it was during that year that I got the telephone call in the middle of the night uh, asking me to be an auxiliary bishop in Toronto. Mm. Uh, the nuncio was not aware, I guess, where the phone call was being placed, it was coming from Ottawa to Jerusalem, and there's seven hours difference. Right. Oh. And so if you're calling at five o'clock Ottawa time, it's midnight in Jerusalem, and a good Jesuit would be in his bed, which I was. <laughs> so I didn't sleep much that night. Uh, the nuncio said to me, the Holy Father has named me an auxiliary bishop of Toronto. Do you accept? And I said, I have a vow as a Jesuit not to become a bishop. Really? Oh, yes. Yeah. I didn't know that. Well, well, that's the way it works. Something we have to explain later on. Right. Well, the Pope, <laughs> the Pope is a Jesuit too, so he, right. he went through this experience. <laughs> anyway, so I said to the nuncio, I said, I have to refuse. And he said, well... Uh, what would it take? And I said, well, I need to consult with my superiors. Oh, no, you couldn't do that because uh, it would leak out and we can't have that. And I said, well, then I, I, I refuse. He said, well, maybe you can negotiate and talk. <laughs> so he gave me two days and I went over to the, I couldn't consult with anybody formally in, uh, in a conversation or spiritual direction, but I went to confession and confession is under the seal. So I said to the priest who was there, I said, I have this, after going through my pen, getting my, my sending my sins and getting my penance and making the act of contrition. I said, something I want to talk to you about. I need, I've been asked to become a bishop, and I don't know what to say, what to do. And he said, well, you know, it is possible for a Jesuit who becomes a bishop to be saved. We know that because Robert Bellarmine was a Jesuit bishop, and he's a saint. Mm -hmm. So nice. calm yourself down. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I thought about it. I still was, uh, was really torn. I uh, felt I should really being faithful to the Jesuit Institute, which is that we don't uh, don't accept the Episcopal office. But when the nuncio called me back, he said, you don't have to write a letter to the Pope explaining why you can't accept his wish that you become a bishop. I said, well, I can't do that. So then I said, yes. Sorry, what year is it? The 1995. Oh. It's almost 25 years ago. 25 years ago next year. It was Bishop Archbishop Kouris, who was the nuncio at the time. He's since passed on to the Lord. Um, so I was named Exodia Bishop of Toronto, and I uh, was uh, happily serving for three and a half years in Mississauga, Brampton, Etobicoke, and the western part of North York. I had 62 parishes when I started, I had 66 when I left. It's a growing area. Toronto is a booming place. Mm -hmm. And uh, in uh, June of 1998, I got a phone call from the Nuncio saying, I have some news for you. Would you like to talk to me on the phone, or you want to come and see me? I said, I'll come and see you. I had a sense. I had a sense of what it was about because when I went to visit one of the schools, uh, we were meeting with the staff after the visitation of the schools, and this teacher said to me, you know, my mother lives in Halifax, and she says you're going to be the next archbishop. Oh. <laughs> I said, I'll be the last to know. <laughs> so the nuncio explained to me the situation. I said, well, you know, I know something about Halifax, Your Grace, because I used to be a teacher down there. And the situation is not as rosy as you describe it, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but I will accept. And so I went down to Halifax and uh, where, you know, I never expected to go back to Halifax after leaving there in 1981. But 17 years later, I went back as Archbishop and I was there for nine years. Hmm. When again, the nuncio said, uh, call me on a, on, a, not on, a, on a landline, not on your cell phone. And he said, the Holy Father's named you uh, Archbishop of Ottawa. This was in 2007. 
And so I came up here on the 14th of May, Feast of St. Uh, Matthias, and we had a press conference, and uh, they gave me a T-shirt with the Ottawa Senators on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I said to them at the end of the press conference, you know, there's something going on inside me. I don't know if I should share this with you or not, but I feel a conversion experience going on in me. I had been a lifelong fan of the Montreal Canadiens. I said, but look at what I'm wearing now. <laughs> That's too funny. So, um, That's now, too it was funny. easy to be converted that year because they were making a run for the Stanley Cup. Right, as you know. right. It was a good year. <laughs> And except for weak goaltending, we might have won it anyway. Oh, uh, goaltending again. <laughs> uh, it's always goaltending. It? It's either goaltending or not scoring enough anyway. So um, I've been a fan of the Senator since I, I've come here. It's difficult these days, isn't it? So anyway. so there's a little bit about my uh, vocation. It's an ongoing thing, as you can see. Yeah. Because uh, I also was invited to uh, be the administrator of the Diocese of Yarmouth for five years, when my last five years in Halifax. And... Since I've been here the last uh, three and a half years, I've been the administrator for the Diocese of Alexandra Cornwall, and last year they asked me to be the bishop. So I have two dioceses. Mm. You're looking at two bishops right here. Right. Uh, <laughs> My location. <laughs> so um, that's been uh, a very challenging, but also wonderful experience. And we're hoping at the end of this coming year that uh, the two dioceses will be united, uh, maybe around June or July of next year. So. That's the, that's the hope. That's the plan. Can we just circle back to, uh, I mean, you found out the first time about being named an auxiliary bishop. You're actually in the Holy Land. And I'm just wondering, having, you know, was there anything because you were there that you recall that made that process interesting for you as you were discerning or anything? Well, I asked Archbishop Hayes, who was the Archbishop of Halifax before I went there. And he was there when I was uh, a teacher there to preach at my... Uh, my ordination in St. Michael's Cathedral. Archbishop Ambrosic was the main cons uh, presiding bishop, and I asked a Jesuit bishop, a friend of mine, to be one of the co-consecrators, and also the man who had ordained me a deacon and a priest, Bishop Thomas Fulton. Mm. And so that was the three. So, But I asked the Archbishop Hayes to, uh, to uh, preach. Uh, he was an excellent preacher, and he said, you know, the text I'm thinking of is, stay in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes upon you from on high. <laughs> wow. So uh, there's that. Uh, <laughs> Small little detail. <laughs> yeah, and, um, you know, uh, other things. Uh, because I had to come back early, I, I was on the verge of beginning my course that I was going to teach, so I had to teach it twice a week yes. over six weeks rather than once a week for 12 weeks. Uh, it was a little bit demanding on the students and a bit demanding on me too because I had lots of things in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to see certain things. I wanted to go to Caesarea on the coast. I wanted to go to the Upper Galilee. And so with a young man uh, who later became a, a Trappist uh, monk and a priest in my ordain, uh, I went with a French-Canadian guy that we had at uh, the École Biblique to travel on a weekend just to see the places I wouldn't have seen because I was coming home early. And uh, the Archbishop, Archbishop Mabrozic, allowed me to go back for the trip to Jordan and, uh, and uh, the Decapolis, those areas of uh, the Holy Land. So Mount Nebo, where Moses uh, passed away after looking at the Promised Land. Mm. So, and, uh, so I got to celebrate there. Uh, now, mind you, I'd been back in Toronto for ordination. Then I did some confirmations uh, in about nine or ten parishes and then went back. And uh, I remember celebrating it with a parish called St. Catherine of Siena in Mississauga which has people from 60 different countries in the, in the congregation, you know, mm -hmm. very mixed uh, ethnic community. And uh, it was kind of like Pentecost. And there I was back in Mount Nebo on Pentecost Sunday uh, with be people from the Ecole Biblique who were from five, about 15 different countries. It was a really quite ex extraordinary. So I had some wonderful experiences. Yes. And I've been back a couple of times since, since the Holy Land, but not for very long. And uh, of course, in a way I was, cheated out four or five months that I was there. Maybe when I retire, I'll go back to the whole Right. <laughs> now, of course, uh, there was some nice young people here before we started the show, and, and uh, just your affinity. You've been at some World Youth Days as well as, uh, as a bishop and an archbishop. Can you speak to that experience and how that uh, affects? I, I uh, really have enjoyed going to World Youth Day. I don't do everything now that I used to do when I was younger. <laughs> 
Um, I uh, skipped a couple of things at the Panama because uh, of the heat and other reasons. Uh, but uh, I really enjoy being with the young people. Uh, I love being with our group from Ottawa. Uh, I've done that travel with the people from Toronto, went to Paris, <laughs> 1997. So I've been to eight World Youth Days, uh, wow. skipped a couple, but uh, I've been to most of them since I was made a bishop. And it's always been a wonderful experience. Uh, I find the young people call the bishops out to articulate their faith and to affirm the truths of our faith. Mm. Remember that speaking at the uh, World Youth Day in Toronto, young people asked, and, and I just said, this is what the church teaches, and they applauded because young people want to hear right. what the church teaches and they want to embrace it, and uh, so I'm, I'm happy to be part of it. And so I say uh, the bishops catechize the young people, but the young people catechize the bishops. They mm. teach us, they call us to to wisdom and to articulation and to bravery. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. So if we could touch maybe a bit on, on your devotion to Our Lady, I've heard you speak on her actually uh, um, homilies on her a number of times. And I've always been struck that, that it seems like you just have a, a very special and precious relationship with Our Lady. And maybe you could share with our viewers a little bit about how that relationship developed and, and, well, it's like most things, it evolves and changes through the years. Um, obviously, I had a very simple piety when I was a high school student and elementary school student. If I would go in and make a visitation to the Blessed Sacrament, uh, I would pr pray the rosary. Um, after a while, you know, sometimes you let things slide. And there were a couple of years, I, I didn't really pray the rosary very much occasionally, but not very often. We prayed the rosary a little bit in my home. But I guess like a lot of families, you begin something with a, like Lent and then it doesn't keep up after that. And <laughs> hey, we were already a family, right? <laughs> we had lots of pressures and lots of different things. So it's gone up and down over the years. Um, but I've been struck by a number of things like uh, St. Bernard saying that there can never be too much about Mary. Mm -hmm. Because people are afraid that uh, Mary will take you away from Jesus. But this is exactly the opposite. Mary brings us to Jesus always. And I know you have a saying from Maximilian Colby in the store behind me here right. that you can never love Mary more than Jesus did. Right. So don't worry about loving her. Um, I think the fact of my mother's death and her kind of uh, encouragement to me, uh, saying that she would always be close to me, tells me something about what Our Lady is like. Uh, obviously, we learn by analogy, by comparisons. And so uh, I've uh, continued to grow in my devotion to Our Lady, I think. Um, in the Jesuits, we have a Lady Queen of the Society of Jesus, celebrated on the 22nd of April. The Jesuits made their final vows at St. Paul outside the walls in 1541, and that's a feast of Our Lady. It was that year. Um, there are other devotions. Obviously, I've been to the Cape a number of times. I had the privilege of preaching the the Novena to St. Anne. Of course, if you know about St. Anne, you know about Mary, so uh, they, they go together. Um, I remember talking also to one of my bishop friends, and uh, I said to him, what do you do when you're in the car? What do you listen to? He said, I don't listen to anything in the car. I pray to my rosary. And I said, oh. I said, That's, you could do that too. So before I listen to anything in the car, unless it's really bad traffic day in Ottawa, uh, I pray three ro three decades of the rosary on the way to work and two on the way back. Oh. Uh, some days you get the whole rosary in, <laughs> depending on traffic. But uh, normally in the morning, traffic is pretty good, so I do three three decades. I do the other two on the way home, uh, and then I listen to the weather to the to the to the road road situation. Uh, but I find that's a regular place for me. And if I don't do it then, or if I'm home my day off, then I'll go for a walk outside and pray the rosary that in the evening or sometime during the day. Is there a particular mystery that you're drawn to or? Well, I tell the youngsters who I confirm, I said, I always remember them when I uh, say the third glorious mystery of the sent Holy Spirit among the apostles. I pray for all the young people I've confirmed and the priests I've ordained and the deacons I've ordained. So that's the gift of the Holy Spirit uh, somehow through my hands. So I remember them. So that has a special, uh, place. Also the joyful mysteries, obviously, uh, the Annunciation to Mary and the visitation and the birth of our Lord. I pray uh, or the, with the presentation mystery, I pray also for the seminarians 
and religious who are under my care or that I have something, some association with. Their parents, in a way, offer them in a way to the to the to to God, and mm -hmm. uh, like Mary and Joseph did to Jesus with Jesus. So those are some of the things that um, stand out for me. Uh, obviously, when the, John Paul II introduced the the luminous mysteries, that was a very powerful addition, I think, to our devotion. Um, I particularly like the first one, the the baptism of. Uh, of Jesus in the Jordan because it reminds us of our baptism. But sometimes I try to link the various mysteries to uh, to my life or the life of the, what's going on in the diocese. Uh, you know, sometimes in the cars can be distracting, but uh, it focuses you, but praying, mm -hmm. the, praying the rosary. But sometimes the contemplation of the mysteries maybe loses a little bit because you're doing two things, you're driving oh, and praying the rosary. Right. But I have, my, I have my rosary with me. I think I brought it with me, yeah. And this is the one that uh, was given to me a couple of years ago. Mm. It was all purple when I started. Really? <laughs> but some of the bees are purple, but most of them are white because they've been thumbed, you know. It's the right size in the car. Yeah. People give me rosaries and they're is there too, something too tiny. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. It's like a Bible. One of my priest friends told me, he said, when he said well, how do you choose a Bible? And I started telling him, he said, just let me tell you how to choose a Bible. <laughs> In other words, the question wasn't to ask me for information, it was to tell me what he wanted. And what he said is this, he said, you pick up the Bible and you feel it in your hand. It feels like you're going to read it, read it. But if you can't read the print, don't buy that one. Right. Because <laughs> it's going to sit on the shelf, right? Same thing with the rosary. I think you need to pick a rosary up that you're going to be able to pray. And somebody gave me a, a rosary from Portugal. And they're all tight, tight pieces. I read it the other day because this was, it was left in the car. But I said, I'm not going to use this again. I'm going to give it to somebody <laughs> because it's not handy for actually what the purpose of the rosary is, which is to touch the beads and get moving. But this one's just the right size for me. Now, you might like others, but that's my, my trick about choosing a, a rosary. I said, take one that you're actually going to use. All right. I have lots in my drawers that I don't use. Uh, those I give away. But use one that, that's going to be helpful for you. So that's what helps. What is it's the, a distraction, eh? Yeah. Anyway. yeah. What, what is, I, was, I want to ask, because you were talking about confirming and ordination, what is that experience like for you when you've got, you know, souls in front of you who have gone, obviously, through this process of discernment and, you know, over and over, all, everything you've gone through, and then, you know, they get to this place where, you know, it's time of ordination. And just from your perspective, I mean, just being involved in that person. What's that like? It's a beautiful thing. Uh, one of the things, of course, is that by the time the person comes to be ordained, if you've had something to do with them, you know the strengths and weaknesses. Mm. Nobody's perfect. And you pray that this priest allow God's gifts to transform him so he can do what the Lord wants. And sometimes it works very well. And sometimes it's like other things in life. It's people struggle. And so yeah, I pray for my priests. Uh, I pray that the grace they were given will continue to, to inflame them and drive them and encourage them. Uh, same thing with, I've had the privilege of ordaining a few bishops, yes. a couple here in the diocese of uh, Archdiocese of Ottawa, the two companions of the cross, Scott McCaig and Christian Riesbeck, uh, others in different places. It's been a beautiful thing for me. Uh, but I pray for them that, that uh, God may do a great work in them with the people in the confirmation, of course, sometimes it's difficult because the training sometimes for confirmation is a little bit less than desirable. Hmm. But, you know, the grace of God is very powerful. We should never underestimate what God is able to do in the hearts of these young people. So for me, that's a great privilege to, uh, to, to confirm. And I know some bishops don't like confirmations, but I love it. I, <laughs> I, I, I don't mind doing confirmations. I've tried to do as many as I can. Obviously, here at Ottawa, I share it with the... Uh, my auxiliaries, but uh, and sometimes with the vicars, uh, Father Jeff and uh, Monsieur Danielle. Uh, but generally, I try to do as many as I can because I think it's important. Also, it gets me to meet their families. Right. And I find with grandparents, they're always proud of their youngsters, right. their grandkids. Yeah. Of course, they don't have to live with them, <laughs> most of them. Uh, but there's always a pride in the child, and the yeah. pride in the fact that they've received a sacrament is a very important thing. So I try to affirm that. I like visiting people in the hall afterwards if there's a reception, taking pictures with them. 
I made a promise when I was ordained I wouldn't refuse a photo. So that's my penance, by the way. <laughs> uh, not to, I have to keep, I have to abstain and fast on the days appointed, but uh, except for that, I don't do any of the penances except for the page for photos. There's always lots with the bishop, lots of photos. Especially, I would say, people who come from other cultures, other lands, uh, like Africans or Asians, sometimes so to be photographed with the bishop is a big thing for them. And right. they, I always say, would you like a family picture? And they always love that because uh, they can send it home. These days, everybody's got a cell phone, right? Yeah. I remember a confirming young lad who was uh, suffering from uh, cerebral palsy and he could barely speak. I confirmed his brother the year before and I said, has Stephen been confirmed? He said, no. I said, why not? They all looked at me and I said, I'll come back next year and confirm. So he did and his father was in Kuwait at the time, but the family sent the picture right away. They were so proud that their mm. child had been included in the church and sometimes that's important, you know. And I remember talking to Bishop Clune, uh, one of my auxiliaries when I was in Toronto. I said, that nephew of yours, or the grandnephew, who's uh, got Down syndrome, have you confirmed them? No. I said, why not? And he had never thought about it. So he did it later. I said, then write an article about that now, because it's important. Down's children and uh, handicapped people, uh, even if they have uh, very little cognitive power, they are children of God, and we need to affirm that and build them up. And and generally, I find families are always so proud of their children, uh, grandchildren. So those are some of my experiences with the sacraments. Obviously, celebrating the Eucharist is also important. And occasionally, I get to anoint people. Not very often. I have to get the formula out because <laughs> my Dawson priests uh, have done it. By the time they were ordained a couple of years, they've done far more than I've ever done. And I don't do too many marriages or uh, or. Uh, uh, confessions, I hear some confessions. Not my priests, I can't hear confessions of my priests. Uh, but uh, I love hearing confessions at the cathedral. So the sacramental life is very important. And so the bishop has a, I guess, a, a tendency to be dealing with the gifts of the Spirit uh, through confirmation and holy orders. But uh, the sacramental life is a wide range of gifts that God has given to us. I think it's a wonderful thing in the church. So. I was struck by when Angelina and I met with you, I remember we kind of came in with, with just speaking with you about the Marian Congress that took place. And uh, I must say, I realized how narrow a view I had of even the diocese after hearing just the, the length and breadth of all the, the places that you were bringing to mind for us. Oh, you've got to include them and, and you've got to include them and you've got to think of, of this group and that group. And, and it just really struck me that this is quite a diverse diocese. And I was two and just, just maybe your, your thoughts of coming to the Archdiocese of Ottawa and, and just maybe the flavor and charism and just from traveling and doing all of these different events. What, uh, what thoughts can you share with us about our diocese? Well, I had a lot of this when I was in Toronto because Toronto is probably the most diverse diocese in Canada in terms of ethnic communities. The, the parish of St. Francis Xavier had 160 different countries present in the parish. 160. They called it St. Francis Xavier wisely, I think. It was, <laughs> uh, it was the last thing I did, by the way, was break ground for that church, and then I was transferred to, a couple of days later to Halifax. But Ottawa is like that on a smaller scale, and I think what's always important, and maybe this gives you and Angelina something to do, is to go to our parishes like the Vietnamese parish. They're, they've invited me to come for a celebration of their feast day, which is the Assumption. It will be the Sunday after. Uh, the Chinese parish is very dynamic, but if we leave them aside and don't make a special effort to go out yes. to them, then they don't become part of the diocese. And I think our Chinese parish has made very strong efforts in that through the purpose, through the, through the presence of our one of our deacons, uh, Peter Fan. Uh, he tries to get the young people to come, and I think it's been a very good thing for them. But there's lots of others: the Polish parish, the Italian parishes, the Spanish parish. Uh, I went to the Spanish parish for confirmations uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, my the priest prepared a homily for me uh, in Spanish, which I could read. Yeah. I don't speak much Spanish, but I can read it. Uh, it's, uh, it's not that hard. They applauded at the end of the homily. I wasn't sure whether it was because they liked what I said or because it was over. <laughs> <laughs> but I told the parish priest at the end, I said, you know, you are privileged with these people because most of the people in that parish who were confirmed were immigrants where people who are poor, 
who uh, had their dignity affirmed by that mass. They were so proud of their children, and many of them were, at, were adult children. Uh, but I said, you've got a great gift there because almost all your people are, in a way, certain have a need. Yes. And Christ is always cl close to the poor. The Holy Father keeps telling us, go to the peripheries, go to the people on the margins. Mm. And I think we need to do that. And then there are margins in our diocese. You know? We need to bring the ethnic communities closer to the local church. They tend to lift a world of their own because of the language. But I think it's important to bring them closer to the church. We have that a couple of wonderful events uh, in the diocese when we have the multicultural mass in January, and also when we have the diocesan feast. We ask them to bring something representing their 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 country. Uh, for the multicultural mass, we have the flags of the countries hanging around the 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 cathedral. Uh, that's symbolic. But outside of those simple gestures, I think we need to include them. For example, in in the rosary bowl, can we reach out to them? Maybe not this year, but next year. You know, right. uh, if this grows, and I hope it will. Yes. Uh, can we make sure that those who come to the Rosary Bowl will reflect the whole diocese? Yes. French and English, uh, Spanish, Portuguese, uh, all, the, all the groups. Our Lady Fatima is important to the people yes. of, uh, of uh, Senora Santa Cristo Parish. But do they feel comfortable coming to this? That's right. the big issue. No? Anyway, is, we have lots, it, lots to think about. It's maybe not too late to invite them right now. Go ahead. So uh, I, I would, tell them the Archbishop said to invite you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm wondering, maybe we could have you invite everybody and we can certainly make the efforts because I remember you uh, writing an email. Oh, use all means possible. So, exactly. so if perhaps we could close off our interview with you, with you inviting everybody and then we'll do our very best to propagate this to everybody. And I think while you do that, we'll have people all praying in unison as, as you do. Great. Well, I'll say this, August 22nd still has enough time for you to plan to come to Ottawa if you're not in Ottawa, or to make sure you rearrange your plans if you live in Ottawa to come that day to the Rosary Bowl or the Mass, some part of this event, or join us by, by your prayers, your uniting your sacrifices and your thoughts to those who will come so that Mary may be honored and through the, her, her son may be glorified and God's will may be uh, manifest in our, in our diocese, our country, and our world. Thank and you. that's for everybody who's listening to this by the internet. I don't know where you are, but come. You're welcome. Right. Our economy needs a shot in the army. <laughs> yes, amen to that too. And maybe we'll get the train running by that time, the LRT. Right. Who knows? Right. I don't think so, but anyway. <laughs> Oh, it's uh, been such a pleasure to have you. Thank you for taking the time to be on DNA Live. And uh, we always close off the show with kind of a, a closing prayer. So I did ask just Father Tim and Angelina to join us. And if you could perhaps uh, close the show with a, a prayer. Yeah. You be good at your... Uh... What did you call? Yeah. Yeah, my wonderful honey husband. <laughs> my love. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we bless and praise you for this time that we've shared together and our hopes and dreams for the Rosary Bowl and for the honor and glory of Mary and of your son, Jesus, that the Holy Spirit may touch the hearts of so many people and flame them with love so that all of us may be truly your holy people. Bless us and Keep us in your love and your care now and always through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Lady of the Rosary. Pray, pray for, for us. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. We'll see you next time. Bye for now. Bye for now.